So um, welcome back. For those of you who have just joined us after closed session, welcome to this regular meeting of the Board of Trustees. I'm Maria Haug, Board President. I would like to introduce my fellow trustees, Lisa Pelosi, Julio Oguin, Jeannie Kerr, and Laura Simon. I would like to also introduce, to the, introduce our district staff, Superintendent Dr. Mary Lou Wilson, Chief Academic Human Resource Officer, Mr. Christopher Heller, Chief Business Official, Mrs. Andy Stubbs, Executive Assistant to the Superintendent and the Governing Board, Ms. Erica Madrigal. Executive Assistant to the Chief Academic Officer, Ms. Melissa Hansen. IT Systems Analyst, Mr. Derek Machado. Additional District and Site administration Administrators who are joining us in the audience. Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Ms. Mary Allen. Uh, District Social Worker and Community Liaison, Ms. Um, Roxana Plancarte. Uh, St. Helena Primary School Principal, Ms. Rebecca Rocha. St. Helena Elementary School Principal, Ms. Tanya Pearson. St. Helena School Vice Principal, Ms. Cr Greg Fetters. We are delighted that you are joining us in person or viewing on Channel 27 or our YouTube channel. Um, and I am sorry, uh, RLS Principal, uh, Ms. Corinne Cox is also with us today. Uh, a copy of this board meeting video will also be available on our website at www.stalinaunified.org. In connection with items 4A and 4B, the board received information and provided staff with direction. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Public comment on, op on, um, on open session items. At this time, the members of the public are entitled to speak on matters that are not on the agenda. You're requested to state your name, address, and keep your comments concise, brief, and limited to three minutes. Are there any public comments on items not on the agenda? Okay, moving on. Presentations. We have a written presentation from our um, our student representative to the board. And I'd like to call on Dr. Mary Lou Wilson. Thank you. Yes, Macy Alvarez is not able to be with us tonight. And so uh, with the board's pleasure, I'd be happy to share her slides and a few comments um, from each of her school site visits. So Macy wanted to start off with um, the report on the high school. Uh, Mr. Sinto and Mr. Fetters worked with the school site council and took the WASC observations and the data from the Healthy Kids Survey to create new goals. Um, uh, uh, much of this, and, and you know, there's lots of goals, and you'll see those later tonight. Um, the adult transition program was one that they wanted to highlight uh, with all of you. Homecoming. Oh my gosh, what a successful week! 271 tickets were purchased for the dance. I believe that's a record in the years that I have been in the district. The float building participation was amazing. The parents preparing um, COVID appropriate meals was great. And students and community members came out for both the powder puff game and the homecoming game. So there was lots of really wonderful participation by all members of the community. At RLS, lots of uh, ex extracurriculars are in place. What you're seeing right there is the band they actually walked in the parade with the high schoolers um, for the first time ever as a marching band, which was pretty exciting. There were some changes in the parade, and so it required a little bit of a run with a tuba. Um, they made it, and it was um, a great opportunity for all of them. Uh, ba boys basketball and girls volleyball games are, are going on right now, uh, and uh, students and staff really enjoyed the Halloween parade at RLS this year. At the elementary school, they also enjoyed um, Halloween. The weather was wonderful. They had a uh, parade on campus. The students grouped by costumes, and um, I understand that there was a little bit of dancing going on as well. Uh, lots of great fun. The homecoming parade change in route this year 
really turned out to be a silver lining with Silverado Trail being closed, Mr. Sinto and Ms. Brazil changed the route pretty quickly to not um, impact 29. So the route actually left from the high school, passed by the primary school, went by uh, the elementary school and RLS and then, um, actually RLS and then the elementary school. And so our primary students and our elementary students were able to watch the parade from their schools with their classes. So as far as an equity piece, all students had access to the parade um, as opposed to in years past when some students were, um, were left school to go to the parade with their families as, a, as an event. And so it was really exciting that um, that silver lining occurred. And they decorated and they cheered the students on and they wore red and it was a lot of fun. And they're seeing lots of growth in reading right now with uh, their Reading Counts program. And there you see the students um, wearing red, having signs to cheer on the parade and some decorations in the main foyer of the elementary school. And on the left-hand side of this slide, uh, you see the calm down corridor. These are uh, exercises, activities that are right outside the main office. And this is for students who might be a little upset for whatever reason, coming from home, coming from the playground, in the classroom. And there are ways for them to calm down. They might choose one that is breathing in, breathing out. They might choose another activity that involves jumping jacks. It's lots of opportunities to be prepared and ready to learn. And I already mentioned the uh, homecoming parade. They've added some different activities for students during recess to support social emotional skills and to provide opportunities for students who aren't interested in playing Foursquare or bouncing a ball. Um, for Dia de los Muertos, they had hot chocolate and conchas. And the I believe the next slide, Erica, will show their um, altar. Take a look at that on the, on the slide. It was beautiful. Each day it was built more and more. And the photographs of loved ones, grandparents, pets, family members, it was truly a lovely, lovely activity for all of the students to participate in. And when I, Macy and I met la earlier this week, she said, you know, it was happening at every school and it was really, in Macy's words, it was really cool to see. And at that point, I believe I'm ready to answer any questions or co comments that I can share with Macy. Comments or questions, board members? Okay, so we'll be moving on to, um, thank you, Mary Lou. Thank you, Macy. We'll be moving on to board um, member reports and I would like to call on Trustee Kerr. Thank you. So this evening I'm going to, um, good evening. Um, this evening I actually have um, uh, put together something for, um, I have a written report. Um, yesterday I had the pleasure um, um, to meet with Dr. Wilson and Ms. Cox at RLS for a site visit. As I was reviewing this month's board agenda, which includes student progress measures and relevant as assessment data, I thought back to some recent conversations that I had with several staff members and students, and I thought what I want to do, I thought what do I want to do with, on my report this month? What would be interesting for my board colleagues? And no doubt about it, the academic success of students is very important. Ms. Cox shared with us um, and this information is also included in her principal report, that during the October measures of academic performance, the MAP growth measure, five RLS English language learners scored high enough to be reclassified as English pro proficient. That is such excellent news. With their hard work and our teaching staff persistence, being reclassified, being re reclassified, I'm sure, has given these students the drive and motivation to continue confidently with their educational journey and most likely present new opportunities for them. Ms. Cox also advised us that the intervention class Read 180, which provides student reading fluency and comprehension, is now down to one section a day with only three students in that class. This is an amazing accomplishment and is, in the, re as, and is the result of all of our teachers and paraprofessionals beginning in the TK classroom, providing the extra support needed for our struggling readers. This is an exa excellent example of our employees collaborating and working as a team for the success of our students. I decided that I wanted to visit a couple of the enrichment classes because I wanted some of my report to include how RLS is educating the whole child. 
This is especially um, this is an especially important time to be educating the whole child because of the upheaval that the pandemic has caused through the last the couple years, and the socio emotional emotion the socio emotional challenges that many of our students are experiencing because of it. These classes help nurture the students' development and learning and provide additional opportunities for our students. We visited makerspace, art, chorus, band, and a couple of the core classrooms, the seventh grade science class, where the students were about to plant some winter vegetables um, um, in the nature trail, and the eighth grade science class where they were critiquing a magnetic experiment. Each classroom that we visited, I noticed engaged students enthusiastic teachers and a feeling of positive school, co school community throughout. I want to thank every one of our employees for your patience and kindness, your professionalism, and being with our students every day, caring for them, listening to them, and supporting them and cheering them on. Our district is so fortunate to have so many caring adults in our district. Um, the last slide, and you can go ahead through the slides, I'm sorry, excuse me, Erica. So this is, um, so this is the makerspace here. And what they were doing is they were, oh, thank you for that. <laughs> and so they were working on prototypes. And this was like the second prototype of like a little, as you can see, like a little, um, it was like a, uh, remember those spirograph things? That's yeah. what that little, okay. that little robot did. Um, and so she was the first one in the class to get it going. So that was, so that was fun for, for the class. Um, and this next one is, I think there are a couple of more, um, Th that class there, that's a, that's a maker space. There's the, a group of boys that were having a really good time trying to figure things out and um, collaborating with each other. Um, the, next, um, the next slide is um, the, the band um, class and it was um, the, it looks like it's the trombones, it predo predominantly it was the horns. Um, and they were, they were doing a great job. There was quite a bit of wind, so there was a lot of environmental things going around them to kind of <laughs> to distract them a little bit, but they were keeping right on task with everything. And to the, to the right of that is the, um, the basketball and volleyball schedules for, um, for this season. And for me, it was kind of like, it's wonderful to see that sports are back. And we're seeing that throughout, certainly throughout our whole district. Um, the next slide. That is at the, um, on the nature trail. And I know that this called something different now. Is that, is that correct, Ms. Cox? Is, trail? Is, is it still the nature trail? Okay, okay, great. Um, so they were, and they were um, preparing, um, um, getting ready to um, do some, some planting on the nature trail. It was a beautiful day. They're doing a great job out there. It's so, I have to say that our, our custodial staff um, at RLS is doing an amazing job. This, the school site looks, I mean, it looks great, it looks wonderful. And then the next slide is, we're in Mrs. Um, uh, Calparis's art room, and there, uh, the classroom, and so you'll see some um, self-portraits, and then on the bottom, one of their big um, art projects was doing um, skateboard, um, the decks. So they got to decorate the skateboard decks. And from what my understanding from Mrs. Calparis is those were, the decks were all, um, it was, um, it happened because of a donation through the foundation. So that was, so that was, so she was very, very thankful. Thankful indeed. And then the next slide, this is the, this is, um, um, our district is very, is so fortunate to have so many caring adults in our district. The last slide, the slide here, is a great example of this. What an awesome season the RLS co-ed soccer team had this year. They ended their season with 11 wins, two losses and one tie. They finished in second place in the North Soccer League, and the coaches were RLS Spanish teacher Mariana Ogim, our very own trustee Ogim, and their cousin Israel Torres. Way to go, Blue Devils. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. President Hall, will you put your microphone on? Thank you, Trustee Kerr. Uh, so You're welcome, thank you. So we're on to the uh, superintendent subcommittee reports. And uh, we had um, four meetings meet, uh, four committees meet. And the first one that met was the equity and inclusion committee. Um, uh, 
I don't know if the two of you coordinated, Trustee Simon and Trustee Elgin, who's, who's going to be reporting? I think we both. Okay, yeah. wonderful. I'm gonna start it and then okay, check Okay, perfect. Yeah. So, see the equity and inclusion. Uh, we met on October 26th and we had, um, we had a lot of participation from not just our staff, but um, our community members, which is always great to see. Um, I think kind of the, we spent a lot of time about having a conversation about what equity and inclusion mean. And so we had an opportunity to kind of look at a definition that, that was put on, the, on, on one of the slides and um, it, was, it was good. I think we talked a little bit and flushed out some ideas and thoughts and, and just, I think for me it just kind of um, showed that everyone looks at equity and inclusion differently and, and I think that the conversations were, um, that we had were, were good because you get to learn about different, um, you know, different people's background. And, and I think overall, I mean, just listening to everyone um, talk about it and, and just talk about their experiences is, is important, I think, for, for, that, um, for that committee because I think it, it, we're trying to collaborate. And I think that it's sometimes we may not ag agree on certain things, but I think it's fair to be able to talk about it and, and acknowledge people's. Um, experiences and perspectives. I, th I thought that was something that I try to do when I participate in not just that committee, but any committee. Um, just being able to listen to people. Um, we reviewed school data, so they, we, we went over some of that. And then um, something that I thought was good, or part of the committee, was the equity matrix. They, they presented that. So again, so when we talk about equity a lot of times you know we we kind of i think a lot most most uh, of the district and a lot of parents know what the definition is but i think just seeing what the actions look like i think that's helpful uh, not just for me but i think for parents to to see what equity means at each um, school site and district level and so mr Sinto did an excellent job just highlighting um the work that's been done at the different school sites and something that he brought up which Again, I, I know, um, you know, equity has kind of been the the thing that's been like the hot phrase or that's been going on now. But I, I think as far as our district, it's been something that they've been working on and addressing on or addressing for several years. So it's it's not that it's not that we just started looking at equity. It's been happening for several years. So I think that that matrix really just highlighted and show, uh, is showing the work that the district has done and, and, and we're continuing to do. So, again, I think really the purpose of the committee was um, to continue to improve it um, and, and continue to develop our practices. And I liked also um, Superintendent Wilson talked a lot about at the end about the committee's kind of role and what what we should be doing with, with the information and not just holding it to ourselves, but really finding opportunities to share it, not just here at the committees, but within other parents and other administrators and staff and teachers. So I thought that that was important just to let those committee members know that that's part of part of the um, conversation that we're having. I think that's all that I have for that. If you want to add anything, yeah. I, um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that I appreciated how um, you know the district feels that things are working, but they're always wanting to improve, um, and by doing that. Um, they added the social worker community liaison position with Roxana Plancarte um, in an effort to continue to build equity and to support families and to also to support, um, to keep um, trying to decrease the dropout rate, which is pretty much close to zero in the district we learned, but to continue to, to support that as well. Thank you. Um, I do have a question about how many um, members are on this committee? 17 or 18. And, and are any uh, students, is there a student voice or a young people's voice as well? We had community members, we had employees, we had board members um, and administrators. I don't recall any students at this time, though we do have students representatives on the LCAP steering and on the wellness and school climate. So it's possible that one might join us. 
I have one question, uh, actually. Oh. Um, would, it, is, would it be possible to see this equity matrix? Is that a document that can be viewed? Yes, of course. Okay. You have seen it in the past um, okay. in a Friday memo, and I'm happy to share it with you in again. In case it was updated, or if, if, if it's been updated since it's been in a Friday memo. Yes, memo. it was updated this year for just the first few months of the year, okay. and the LCAP Steering Committee will be getting it um, in a follow-up meeting okay. email, and I'm happy to share it with the well, board as I'll well. I'll probably see it then, Dr. Wilson, as well. I just was, it just thought it might, sound, might be something that's good to review. So Absolutely. Okay. It's very exciting. Okay. Thank you. Okay, on to wellness and school climate. That's Trustee Kerr and Trustee Elgin. Yeah, I think we're gonna split this as well. Um, so that one uh, we met on November 2nd. Uh, that, that was also our first meeting. Um, we started off by just introductions and discussing the purpose of the committee. And just as a reminder, the school climate piece is new to that committee because that used to be part of the equity and inclusion or equity um, committee but now it's part of the wellness so that was something new as, as part of the that committee um, we reviewed the LCAP goals and kind of talked about it or th being the main focus this year is, is kind of the overall um, theme as a student and staff wellness so that's something that they, they highlighted um, we had reports and updates from, so I'm just gonna go briefly over those for each one. We had food services, we had Angela Baxter a report, and I'll just highlight a couple things from each one. She was um, just mentioning about the free meals and how that's gonna continue through the year, and I think she said there's they're averaging about 1,200 meals per day, so the, there's a lot of um, students that are um, to, you know, using the, the food and, and, and eating every day, so that's good. Uh, the menu, she said, um, they they slightly expanded it, so they're op they're offering more um, vegetarian options. So that's and in incorporating the the gardens and stuff. And then just I think one of the goals that she had was just more um, meal variety and, and menu development throughout the year. So they're looking at, at at figuring ways to develop that. I think that one of the issues was about the food. Um, the food shortage, or not food shortage, but certain materials that are hard to, harder to get and more expensive, so she talked a little bit about that. Um, then we had a report for, or uh, update from mental health services. We had uh, Dana Saban, Terry O'Leary, and Sean Garrity. And they talked a little bit about just the student services and and what, what they offer and how students um, can get these services. Um, I think that for the most part, they reported that there are higher levels of referrals this year, so um, students are accessing those services. Um, she, um, they talked a lot about just collaborating and connecting with and setting up partnerships with um, other organizations that are supporting our students, and some of the organizations were news and then uh, the LGBTQ connection. And then we had um, the social services, so we had an update from Roxana, um, and she uh, she has a report tonight, so she, I'm sure she's going to go a lot more in detail, but just kind of her role has been just about partnering with um, a lot of the local organizations, so like the uh, a Valley Family Center, but um, kind of the main role has been just connecting the families to those services, so I think that she's done an excellent job with that. And then, do you want to, do you want to talk to, okay. Um, yeah, so then Miss um, Allen, she, um, she, um, discussed with us the um, the social emotional survey and that so that there and I think we talked about this last uh, month where we're going to be um, using the SEL um, it's through um, zoom data zone data zone data zone um, I knew there was a Z in there I couldn't remember I apologize um, through data zone and that that survey is being taken right now th uh, the fourth through the 12th graders and so that that survey will be used for not only through the um, the wellness, but also the LCAP, um, as far as kind of another way of touching base, so kind of getting a touch point from our students as far as how they're feeling about things. Um, and then there, and she also, uh, Ms. Allen also um, uh, described as the, the Cal Healthy um, Kids presentation and kind of described, you know, to give, gave us a little bit of um, um, information about that. Um, there is the, um, and then we are having um, some uh, student panels as well, and so that'll be similar to the LCAP, where it's gonna be student panels. And so Mr. Heller is um, 
uh, we set up a committee to develop those questions. So those questions will be, will be coming forthcoming. Um, and then there will be a, um, we're gonna be reviewing the 2021 wellness goals. Um, and those are the goals that we get from kind of the beginning, from um, what we did last year and the kind of reviewing what we wanna do for the, the coming years. And then our board policy 5030, our student wellness policy, that's up for review. So that's going to be, that's gonna take a lot of our time kind of later on um, in the year when we're gonna start doing the review of our board policy and just make any um, necessary changes that we need to do. And that was, that was, do you think that, anything else that you? Okay, perfect. Trustees, any questions? No, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. And then on okay. to uh, business operations. That's uh, Trustee Pelosi and Trustee Simon. Trustee Simon's going to take it. Okay, so the business operations meeting met on November 10th, and in attendance were Principal Cox, middle school teachers, and parents. And um, Andy Stubbs gave a thorough presentation. Um, she began with the background on the field, um, history of the drainage, um, the drainage issues, um, and then the business operations committee learned about the options for the field renovation, um, from reseeding um, to replacing the granite gravel around the field as, as necessary, um, all the way to replacement with artificial turf and including a asphalt or soft top track. Um, we also discussed budgetary considerations for each option. Um, I believe there were four options that we discussed. Um, and we also discussed the ongoing local water situation um, and also the state drought situation and how that's not going away anytime soon. Um, so looking towards um, an option um, to take into consideration uh, that wouldn't necessarily requiring watering the field and coming back, being put back into the situation that we are currently in. Um, there was a consensus support for options three and four, and that would be artificial turf with black, um, with the asphalt or the uh, soft top. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So that, um, that is, uh, very interesting news. Um, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are watching tonight that um, would like to hear more and they can always talk to the district office about what's going on. Ms. Stubbs, you'll be providing a report to the governing board in December, correct? Correct, yes. So there'll be lots more information to come. Great, thank you, thank you. And um, any other questions, trustees? Uh, on to the final um, subcommittee, LCAP Steering Committee, that's Trustee Kerr and Pelosi. I'll start. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we met on Tuesday. Uh, Trustee Kerr was in person and I was on Zoom. Um, there were about 17 or 18 of us in attendance and um, a lot of what you've heard already is now part of our LCAP meeting. So. Um, I'm not gonna really repeat a lot of that because we review equity, we review wellness, we, re do, we review engagement. But the one thing I do want to share is that one of the first things that we uh, discussed was our district priorities and what happened from there is subcommittees, a subcommittee was created. And uh, the purpose of that subcommittee is that they were charged with digging down deeper of what each priority means. So for example, when you see, you know, goal number one is increased achievement for all students. What does that really look like? What does that really mean? So the committee, and they did a fantastic job of going through lots and lots of information. They came up with bullet point descriptors for each goal. So for, you know, so you'll see this, so that way, when somebody says, well, what does that really mean for St. Helena Unified? They'll now know that increased achievement for all students means and then you go through, you'll see a description. I'm not gonna you know, go through every single one. We'll be here for quite a while if I did that. So, um, but um, you know, Dr. Wilson took the first goal, the uh, um, Principal Rocha took number two, Principal Pearson took three, Principal Cox took four, and uh, Andy Stubbs took goal five. So I really think that that's gonna help our community and our staff and, and everybody really uh, you know, describe what these goals actually mean for our district. Um, and um, I think, you know, that's kind of, that's the biggest takeaway because 
again, we discussed wellness, which you just refer, you know, which you guys went over, and equity as well. So, Jeannie, if there's another highlight that you want to talk about, um, yeah, plus you know, we have LCAP information tonight as well. So yeah, so yeah, so it's thanks, thanks very, thank you, um, Lisa. You know, one of the things at the very end is there was a there was a a big shout out to all of our par our partners, our school partners, just because without our partners, that's the Up Valley Family Center, St. Helena Preschool for All, our Clara Clora, go, you know, just everyone that works with us, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing without them, um, just because they, they, they have a lot, they, they work with our students as well and our employees as well. Um, and then also I wanted to mention that at the, um, at the, at the wellness um, committee, there was a, a conference. There was a um, one of our um, one of our uh, teaching staff mentioned that it would be really nice if they were, if there was some way that their that their staff that staff in general would be able to um, do some kind of like a uh, like mental or physical physical type of um, activity kind of during the daytime during the school day, and so. What I was really pleased with is when we came into this meeting here, we, it was announced that um, um, Ms. Stubbs took the, all that into consideration. And instead of doing like a district-wide kind of mental a mental and health thing for our staff, like remember the, there was the online yoga and the, the mental thing, the, the, the um, aerobics and things, each site is now going to have their own discretionary fun, funds so they can do what they would like with their whatever their whatever their um, employees want to do at each site. Um, so I thought that that was a brilliant, brilliant idea. And so that's, that's uh, is there anything else? No. Lisa, do you think? No, I think that, no, that was, that's a, definitely a highlight, right. so. Great, thank you. Are there any questions, trustees? Okay, thank you, moving on. Thank you, fellow trustees who reported. Um, Moving on to item 8C, um, we have the St. Helena Teachers Association report to the board. Uh, Brandon? Good evening. Um, Good evening. <laughs> um, there are, um, not, it hasn't been that, um, Exciting as a fall has been in the last five years, and we actually feel really good about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> closures and all those things like that have been um, avoided so far. So, uh, actually, from an SHT per SHTA perspective, we've gotten to do a few of the things that we have not been able to do in the last fall. Like we jo rejoined the Basic Aid Coalition. We just had a recent meeting um, for that, and that has. Um, not been going on for the last five or six years so uh, it was nice to get an email about that so uh, a couple of our members and myself took part in that meeting and we learned quite a bit about some of the other districts and what some of the other basic aid districts are um, going through and, and, and talking about and that's that's good um, some other things that uh, we're doing, um, you know, we, we're getting more participation, a little bit more participation in the committees, um, and uh, the school's winding into the break mode, uh, where everybody's looking forward to the next break because there's a lot of them. Um, and uh, but we are still trucking along with, um, you know, classes and and, and teaching, and and uh, it seems like things are, are are moving smoothly across all four sites. So. I really appreciate all, all the help. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. And then we have CSEA President Christina Avina's report was submitted um, in a written form. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, item 8E, the superintendent's report, Dr. Mary Lou Wilson. Yes, we'd like to remind the school community that the district of choice application window will end at the end of November. Any families do, that do not reside within our attendance area that are interested in being considered as a part of that objective lottery applications must be turned in before the end of November. Well, St. Helena Hospital Foundation once again came to uh, the rescue and uh, the, the moment that 
Children ages 5 to 12 were um, eligible for vaccines. We had a vaccine clinic scheduled and on the books, and that was for first held on November 5th. The second dose will be held on December 3rd. You might think that that's a week longer than what typically it would be, and it is because the actual um, day would have been during the Thanksgiving holiday. So uh, Mr. Newhart assures me that adding that additional week is fine and that families um, can be confident in getting that second dose on the 5th, I'm sorry, on the 3rd of December, or they could choose to receive that second dose in another location. The uh, vaccine clinic on the 3rd will be held again at the St. Helena Primary School in the barn for any second doses and also for any first dose students ages 5 to 12 only. And then as Mr. Farrell mentioned, we do have an upcoming holiday next week is the week of Thanksgiving and that is a non-student week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Concludes my report. Thank you. So um, on to uh, the um, principal's written reports. Um, I would just like to thank all our principals for the reports that they've prepared. I will, um, I will be highlighting, um, I'd like to highlight our, uh, all of our parent and community volunteers of the month. Um, I'm just gonna read their names. Chrissy Raymond, Doug Cutting, Greg Bowen, Shauna, Sean Mora, Mark Fuller, Mark Hoffmeister, Julio Ogin, and Laura Pe Lauren Pesch. And I'd also like to highlight our ELAC and DLAC uh, members at the SHPS, um, Ms. Maritza Sierra Calderon, Araceli Morales, Alicia Mora, and Paula Legoreta Galindo. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced any names, but I want to thank all of our community members um, and honor our volunteers of the month. Um, uh, Jeannie already stole my other highlighted from the um, principal's report, was, which was those five students who were reclassified as English proficient. Um, congratulations to the students, their families, and to all the teachers who have helped them along their way. It's really exciting news. So um, on to the consent agenda, item nine. The consent agenda contains routine items judged as appropriate to be acted upon in one motion. If a board member requests that an item be removed from the consent agenda, the item will be considered under discussion action items. Is there anyone present who wishes to comment on this agenda item, public comment? Are there um, any trustees that have any questions about this agenda item? Yes, um, can, I would like to um, take off item F, please, the contracts under 25,000. Okay, um, uh, any other questions or comments, board members? Okay, um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda minus item F, approve the contracts under 25,000 for November 2021? I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. Um, I would like to open um, the uh, item 9F for discussion. Thank you. Um, my specific question just uh, is regarding the PK um, contract that we have. I do believe PK is a program that we've had in this district for quite a while, correct? Ms. Allen, is that is that correct? For some reason, I remember it back in the day. <laughs> uh, we've had PK before. It's okay. a parent institute for quality education. Okay. And it's for parent engagement, uh, predominantly Hispanic parent engagement. Correct. To understand the school system and how it works. Uh, we haven't had it for many years, and now we're going to be bringing it back. Okay. So I guess I, what I, I was reading through the agreement, um, and I'm assuming that they are, they are bilingual sessions, or are they conducted solely in Spanish? They're conducted solely in Spanish. Okay, okay. Um, and if there are less than 50 parents that were to sign up, is there is there any reduction in costs or is the cost the cost? Uh, I'm gonna, from years past, the cost is the cost. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I just, 
in the agreement it says for the above reference schools, but I know the location says primary and elementary, but I wasn't sure if it was K through 12 or if it was the whole district or if it was a couple of schools. I wasn't clear on that. It's actually targeting the lower grades, okay. so we're, tar we're trying to target the TK-5. Okay, that's what I thought maybe with the location, but I was not clear, so thank you so much. Um, those are my only questions, thank okay. you. Um, do I have a motion to approve, uh, to approve um, item 9F contracts under 25,000? I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. On to item 10A, student learning and achievement. Um, update for the local control accountability plan. Presentation from district social worker community liaison. Um, first of all, I'm going to be um, calling on uh, Mr. Christopher Heller. Yes, <clears throat> good evening. Um, last year when we received notification that our community liaison was intending to retire, uh, we began thinking about redesigning that position. And with the COVID-19 pandemic still impacting students and families, we brought to the governing board a revised job description that expanded the community liaison to include social work. Our interview process brought forward a candidate who's really embraced the position and has had an opportunity to share the work she's accomplished already and her plans for the future. So I'd like to introduce Ms. Roxana Plancarte. So hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, right here. Click it. Where? Oh, I clicked it. Oh, they said I have to click it. Okay, so my presentation is going to talk a little bit about my role as a social worker and community liaison for the Santa Lina Unified School District. So I wanna start off by just reading a definition from the National Association of Social Workers. And this definition I think really highlights um, my role within the district. School social workers are an integral, integral link between school, home, and community in helping students achieve academic success. They work directly with schools, administration, as well as students and families providing leadership in forming school discipline policies, mental health intervention, crisis management, and support services. I think, you know, given the strengths of the district, which I just thought about a few, I know we have many more, um, this position is something that directly ties to all the things that we discuss in terms of the LCAP, but more so with the strengths that the district represents, which I see as being a, very, a district that's very collaborative, um, strong systems of support already in place, um, a strong understanding of supporting the whole student, and a district that takes initiative and is willing to adapt. Within my role, these are the different areas that I see myself supporting. Um, student support services, the multi-tier systems of support, MTSS model, community collaboration, parent engagement and support, district-wide systems of support, and staff development and support. I wanted to talk a little more about student support services and just kind of give a little example of each of in the ways that I have so far um, supported within the district. The first one is the crisis response and case management. Um, I was given the role of responding to mental health crises within the district um, and when when I was given that role, my first thought was, let me look at what's already in place of how the district has been responding to students in crisis. Um, and in doing so, I started doing more research to understand a little more about what are the evidence-based practices and current protocols that we have in terms of responding to mental health crises. Um, so I took on the role of just modifying and strengthening what we already have in place. Um, created a protocol that involves a um, suicide risk assessment, which is the Columbia Suicide Risk Assessment Protocol um, that's widely used across um, California and in our country um, in schools to make sure that we are identifying students needing um, additional um, support than what schools can provide. Um, so far this year, uh, we have, I have responded to approximately, I think, 10 cases district-wide of students presenting um, with a mental health crisis. And how that looks is that 
I work with the school site already with the counselors, the administrators, um, meet with the student, gather a little more information, and then work with the parents to make sure that the student receives a formal suicide assessment either through one of our local hospitals or the Napa County Crisis Center. And then when the student's ready to return, we make sure that we work together to create a re-entry plan and to make sure th that the student is receiving all the supports they need outside of school but also within our schools so that they can succeed and also be in a good state of mind. Um, the next one that I think is really important to just highlight is the support that we provide our McKinney-Vento and foster youth. Um, at the start of the school year, there were 42 families from, previous, from the previous year that qualified as McKinney-Vento eligible. A lot of them were eligible because of the glass fire. Um, so what I did is that I initially called all those families to evaluate whether they were still eligible and provide information about what it means to be uh, McKinney-Vento eligible. Um, so far, we only have 25 families that qualified for this school year. A lot of the other families um, were already in permanent housing and no longer qualified. Um, and then my role within those 25 families is to make sure that I'm supporting them in case there's a need, for example, a lot of those families were needing support with transportation, so making sure that they have the application for transportation, help them fill out those forms. Um, some of them also needed support with um, accessing resources, so connecting them to that Valley Family Center or any other place that can support some of those needs. Number three, um, this one's really important to me because of my own self. Um, I've been supporting the case management for newcomers and also English language learners within our district. Um, and I've been doing so by calling, initially I just called all the students, parents who are in ELD1 at um, Santa Elena High School and Robert um, RLS, um, making that connection with the parents to make sure that they understand what it means for their students to be, for their students to be English learners and then working with the teachers for ELD1 um, and supporting the students as well. So I visit the ELD1 classes both at the high school and the middle school at least once a month um, so that students can see who I am, they can build a relationship, and if I need to support them further, they already know who, who I am and um, hopefully will be more willing to work with me. Um, so I've been doing that since um, August um, and I really enjoy just being in the classroom and seeing what the teachers are doing in terms of supporting the students. Um, the next one, case management for tier three services. This one is really building on the MTSS model and working with students, families, and community-based organizations to provide, support and to provide support and services in areas of mental health, behavioral health, and basic needs. And I'll talk a little more about that in the next one. Um, but I just wanna give an example of what that would look like. Um, for example, we had a student at one of our school sites who was really struggling to come to school, and after really thinking about what it's, what's making it difficult for the student to come, we decided to do a home visit. When we did the home visit, we found out that the student was really struggling with mental health, but also health. Um, so my first step was in terms of supporting the student was finding out a little more about what services were already in place. Um, we got release forms, talked to the previous providers, and um, decided as a team that the student could really benefit from home hospital services. So the student was placed in home hospital, reconnected with mental health counseling, and now is working with their medical providers to make sure that they understand what the health condition of the student is. Um, with all of that in place, the student is participating actively in home hospital, has made a lot of progress in terms of completing and catching up with schoolwork, and hopefully will be returning back to our campus. Um, so that's just one of the examples of what it means to support the tier three services for students within our school district. Um, I'm not gonna highlight all of these, but these are some of the district-wide systems that I've been working with. And like I said, all of these were already in place. It's more about strengthening, it, strengthening them and continuing to inform them so that we're always um, following any new things that come up within our, within our state and um, that we need to meet for these students. Um, community collaboration, I think, really ties with social work, but also really ties with my role as a community liaison. Um, we've been working really closely in terms of building supports for um, students working with community-based organizations. 
And I know that one of our reports already mentioned this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just want to highlight that we've been building some new relationships, it's relationships and using that in today's agenda um, with um, agencies from Napa that were previously not providing services for students here in Santa Elena. Um, and the reason for this is that we have a lot more need uh, with our students right now because of the pandemic, but also because of just what it means to be a student in middle and high school. Um, so these agencies already have programs in place to support students and are willing to be on our campuses and to provide the services without requiring families and students to travel to Napa to access them. Um, so some of these agencies are NEWS, which um, has a youth matter program that focuses on providing healthy relationships coaching for students. Um, the other one is LGBTQ Connection, which is more s focused on providing LGBTQ um, education, awareness, and support for students and families. Um, and then Aldea and Burnett Therapeutic Services are both mental health agencies that will work with us if their school-based therapy that we offer, um, it's not meeting the needs of the students because they have a higher level of need, or students and families are deciding that school-based support is not what they, what they need. Um, so these partnerships um, have, are new to the district, and my intent is that hopefully we'll support um, um, and work, we'll complement what's already in place with that Valley Family Center and the school-based therapy that we offer. Parent engagement is the last piece that I'll talk about. Um, in terms of parent engagement, one of the roles that I've taken is in supporting the, the sites with ELAC. Um, and I think, you know, this one really ties back to supporting our newcomer students, our English learner students as well. Um, we have been able to really engage a lot of our parents so far this school year. Um, at the beginning of the school year, I made it my goal to call most of these parents. I made about 145 phone calls to introduce myself as the social worker for the district. Um, and I think those phone calls make a difference as you'll see in some of the survey results that we, that we that I'll share. Um, I also um, help support in creating a survey for some of our ELAC members to better understand their needs and their interests. Um, and we are using those results to um, organize the ELAC meetings that we have. Um, the other one that I wanna highlight is Ask 12. Ask 12 is a program from Napa Valley Adult Education that focuses on providing technology support for parents. Um, we uh, decided that this would be a really great support for our families um, because a lot of them were having a really hard time um, accessing technology and being engaged within the district because of that reason. Um, so as 12, um, because of that, we have a person from adult education that's coming to our district office once, um, twice a month to meet with parents and provide 45 minute appointments to meet the basic needs of some of our families in terms of understanding technology. Um, other things, are, I'm just gonna name them, uh, community presentations and then working with the primary school to do some home visits for our kinder students. And all of those things are focused on building relationships with the families. Um, some of the ELAC survey results that I wanna highlight um, we had a really good response. We had about 130 responses for the ELAC survey. Um, they were either done um, electronically through sur um, SurveyMonkey, or we also sent the surveys with the students um, if the parents prefer a paper copy. Um, and as you can see, we had responses from all um, grade levels. Um, they, we talked about what is their preferred method, method of communication. A lot of parents highlighted the phone calls and the text messages. Um, so we've been using that now to continue to engage parents, making sure that we're calling parents, we're sending messages because some of them, like I said, are still not able to access their emails um, or don't really know how to um, navigate technology in that way. Um, a lot of them showed a lot of interest in improving um, your child's literacy, which was the first focus of our second ELAC meeting, um, which I think we had about 49 parents that showed up to that meeting, and we actually had um, Trustee Olguin do a presentation as well about his experience as a student in the district and also growing up in the community. 
Um, and these are some of the other topics that we'll be focusing on in our future ELAC meetings. Um, we asked parents about how they felt with, um, about Santa Elena Unified School District providing a welcoming environment and opportunities to develop trust and respectful relationships with families. And as you can see, a lot of them strongly agreed. So I think it's really important to highlight that we already have a lot of parents who see themselves as being part of our district. Um, and if we integrate some of the things that we learned from the survey, we're just gonna grow from there. Um, let's see. Um, there's a lot of interest of, from parents to participate in these ELAC meetings. Um, and we've seen that in the past two um, ELAC meetings that we've had. Um, in terms of goals and next steps, um, I wanna continue to work collaboratively with each school, each school site to build on the district systems that we already have in place and find any other ways that we have opportunities to grow. Um, work with our community-based partners to make sure that we continue to promote student wellness within our school district. Um, and I, one of the things that I hope to kind of move towards is working more closely with students to make sure that everything that we do is student driven and that it's appropriate to the culture of the students in our district. Um, parent engagement, we will continue with that. As was mentioned, we are trying to work uh, with PK, the program that was previously here. Um, and that is something that I will take a lead in, in terms of making sure that parents are engaged and they know how to access that program. Um, and then hope, hopefully working more closely with, family, um, with school sites to strengthen our MTSS model. Um, and then just to close off, I just wanna say that all these things, like I mentioned, are things that were already in place within our district. My role is to continue to support those. Um, and it's a, it, the social work role is really one that's built on relationships, collaboration, and coordinating. So everything is done as a team. Um, so I feel very supported and thank um, all the school sites for welcoming me and making sure that we're able to do all this work together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pankart. Is there any public comment on this agenda item? <coughs> Trustees, comments and questions? Well, I kind of don't know where to start because I'm just blown away by all that wonderful information that you presented. I, I first just want to say thank you. Um, I, I, I know from, from this building to down to the school sites, there's nothing but compliments and praise for the work that you've been doing that's been you relayed to, to me and I'm sure to the fellow trustees. But um, I, I think that you've, you've hit the nail on the head by saying it's, you, you've increased engagement just by the personal connection. And in a, in a period of where people are behind screens a lot or don't pick up the phone, um, 145 phone calls, Roxana, is a lot of phone calls. So um, thank you. I, 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 you know, I, I guess my, I don't really have questions per se. I just, you know, if you feel there's something more you need to perform your role in this district, it sounds like you are well supported, but if there's something more, that you need board support for, uh, you know, that's what we're here for because you're making a difference for our students and their families. And I'm extremely grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Olgi? Yeah, I just wanted, I mean, I've, I had an opportunity to talk to her prior to, um, we had a meeting at, at about, she wanted to learn more about St. Leon Preschool for All. And we talked a lot about parent engagement and stuff like that. And some of the work that I've been Trying, trying to do as well. Um, and I just appreciate the conversation that I had with her and I appreciate her um, inviting me to the ELAC meeting because that is actually an area and I do apologize to the ELAC group. I've, I haven't gone to a meeting and it's been on my radar. So when she asked me, I was like, yeah, I, I, I've been a trustee for a while and I, I, I should have attended that sooner, but she put it together and I just the uh, experience of being in that in the auditorium. I thought it was gonna be a, just a classroom, but it was an auditorium and it was a big slideshow and I had pictures and it was, it was emotional because I, I had my mom there and she, she was here um, during, you know, when I was in the district and she talked about her experience and not understanding the language and how it was different back then. And so just all the work that the district has done to, and to see like a lot of the families there was, was powerful to me and I, I felt, um, very connected to, you know, to share that experience. So I, I just wanted to thank her for giving me that opportunity to, to share my story. So I think that that was, and, and also the principal was 
Principal Rocha was there and her staff did a, a great presentation and it was very just interactive and people were engaging and having conversations. So I thought it was just all the work that she's done to bring everything together. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I just want to echo um, uh, Trustee Pelosi's um, thoughts. Thank you so very much for everything that you're doing that you, that you have already done. I mean, and and she was right. I've I've heard a lot of really really positive communi um, um, positive things about you and the work that you're doing. So thank you very much. We're, we're very appreciative. Very appreciative. Um, I just also would, uh, or no, go ahead. I just also want to um, say that I, it was probably several weeks back. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Wilson shared um, one case that you had been working on um, and the effectiveness that you had had on this child, and um, uh, just from the the way that. Um, we could see that you helped that uh, that family and that student. It it really um, it really made me feel really so happy that we have gone forward with the, um, your position and that we have you in it. And uh, you've already made a big difference, I know, in a lot of students' lives. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. President President Alger, if it's okay, can I ask if she can? departs and she's expecting yeah. Yeah. yes 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 of course thank you okay so on to um, um, item uh, 10b which will be the um, LCAP plan update the RLS presentation on equity and inclusion um, I'd like to call on Ms. Corinne Cox. Good evening. Um, so let me, okay. So I'm reporting this evening on um, equity and what we're doing to foster that at RLS. And I um, arranged this, this presentation based on our LCAP goals since everything that we do is um, designed to support those goals. The first goal is academic growth and closing the achievement gap. And some of the things I'd like to highlight that we're doing in that area is um, the leadership team at RLS, which is myself and four teachers who represent all the core subject areas as well as all grade levels are in our first year of the UC Davis California Principal Support Network training. Um, the primary and elementary schools have already gone through that training and we're joining them this year. It, it focuses on professional learning communities and using data to support students. We um, have been deeply enmeshed in AVID for many years and um, are using AVID strategies school-wide and RLS is a school-wide um, AVID school. Um, it's, being, it's been recognized as a AVID demonstrate school-wide, <laughs> I'm spitting that out, sorry about that. <laughs> we have school-wide AVID. Um, and that means that every teacher is using strategies in class to reach every student in a variety of ways to provide equity in education so that um, we're um, intentionally choosing how we reach out to kids and making sure that we're supporting them in the ways that they need. A few years back, uh, we eliminated Honors English, and I included that in this report even though it wasn't done this particular year because this is what we've been doing over the course of time to close the achievement gap and um, to create equity and eliminating honors English is something that we did at RLS and that the high school has done as well. And it seems counterintuitive to think that we're supporting kids by doing that, but what we're doing is creating equity in access to classes and reducing class sizes across the board and um, giving everybody the opportunity to take the classes that they need to take. Um, we have been very fortunate to have bilingual paraprofessional support and have been able to adjust our master schedule so that they are um, strategically placed in classes so that they can support needy students in resource classes, res the resource support program, in English language development classes, and also in core classes. And that is really thanks to, um, to our um, 
English language development teacher, Dana Simon, to Terry O'Leary, and to Kate Brethauer for working really closely with me to adjust the master schedule so that we can constantly shift students around to make sure that we're utilizing the resources that we have in the most effective possible way. Um, our English language um, development teacher has an instructional support period, which has been incredibly helpful in in getting to the reclassification levels that we have gotten to because a lot of reclassification cannot be done by one person. It's a team effort. It's everybody working on it in every single class, every single day. And teachers, even though in order to have a credential, you have to have a certain amount of training, it's not the same as having somebody working with you every day to meet the specific needs of the students in your classes that are the most needy and to help you write lesson plans and to help you figure out what you need to do so that you can reach that student and bridge that gap. And that is what um, we've been able to do. And then we also have the paper online tutoring program. I know you have heard about it before, but it's 24 seven online access in any subject area um, in a multitude of languages, including English and Spanish. Under LCAP goal two, social justice, equity, and access, we have a new class this year uh, called Bias in Society, and it uses the Anti-Defamation -Def League curriculum, um, which is amazing. Mr. Mills is teaching it, and he has been extremely pleased with the curriculum. Um, it's just in sixth grade right now, and then um, it, it, it we may end up finding a way to fit it in. It's, it's rather difficult because of credentialing issues, um, but it's really important and it's very well done. Uh, we also continue to have a weekly access period um, and the Clara Claro program, which is uh, also at the high school where um, our Hispanic um, children are receiving support um, at lunchtime during that program. We, a few years, about three, right before COVID, I believe, um, the board approved having free PE uniforms for all, which obviously that is an equity issue and supports our students by not making it um, difficult for parents to have their kids um, to purchase um, essential supplies for their students. Um, we have Unity Club, which meets um, once a month at school and where they are being supported also with the LGBTQ Connection, which is a community partnership. Unity Club is open to any student who wants to come and either be just hear about what's going on, who may be um, having issues um, with their uh, gender or sexuality or anything in their own lives or who wants to be an ally or just wants to know what's going on. And then um, we also this year have extended learning opportunities um, that are being provided to our socioeconomically deprived and English language learner students first, and then reaching out to other students, um, but those two groups are the priorities for that program. LCAP goal number three is expanding stakeholder engagement, and Roxana just talked a lot about all the things that um, are happening with her assistance to make that um, be more effective in our district. So the district social worker has is, is um, been hugely impactful. Um, she has worked with us to reorganize ELAC to increase parent engagement, and it has most definitely done that um, already. It's made a huge difference. Uh, we're also having hybrid parent group meetings. Uh, over the last few years, we've struggled to have um, parents show up for parent group meetings, so we're trying to open more ways for them to meet. Some people have a really hard time meeting in person and it's more convenient for them to be online. Other people are uncomfortable with the online way and would prefer to come in person. And then we bounced around with times trying to figure out um, the best time. And I think in the end, there isn't really a great time. So, <laughs> so um, we've settled on you know 5.30. If it gets too much later than that, we found that it, um, it's really hard for people to leave in the middle of dinner. Um, we, do we solicit student voice in a number of ways that we survey students um, regularly on issues that we find that are happening at the uh, school level. And then we've also had panels um, um, at the LCAP committee and we'll be doing more with that. Uh, we'll be talking more about that in future presentations. Um, we're refining family groups this year to support more relationship building. And then we've been doing some staff team building. You can see Kendra Kelparis and Deb Carnes there and part of our staff staff team building. 
LCAP goal four um, is, has to do with culturally responsive and healthy practices. So we're continuing with responsibility centered discipline program. And uh, in the next presentation, you'll see some of the data on how effective that program has been. Um, Multi-tiered systems of support, which um, Roxana spoke to earlier, is continuing at school. We have an entire panel that meets every other week um, to focus on behavior, academic, and social emotional needs of targeted students. That panel includes um, our counselor, um, Dana Sabin, our behavior specialist, myself, Roxana, the nurse if needed, um, Mr. Samuels, our campus supervisor, and then whoever else might have a specific uh, student whose um, support they could um, assist with. We're continuing with second step social emotional curriculum. Um, we also offer extensive mental health and wellness support to our students through our partnerships with Up Valley as well as our own counseling. And each day we continue to have dated daily guided breathing practice for all staff as well as all students. Any questions? Uh, are, is there any public comment on this agenda item? Uh, trustees, questions or comments? No, my questions were actually answered. I had a couple, but Principal Cox answered them. Well, I'm glad I was able to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. It was informative. That was, that thank, was you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. It was very informative. Thank you. Um, so at this point, it is 7.15. Um, I would like us to take a 10-minute break until uh, 7.40. Uh, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> yes. so if I could add, I mean, 7.25. <laughs>
night star, you know, just like last night. So um, rejoining after break, thank you everyone. Uh, we are on to item 10C, presentation on school-based student data to develop site action plans. I'd like to call on Mr. Chris Heller. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. In previous years, district staff would create and compile extensive data to show student progress in sev several categories. With the suspension of longitudinal assessment data, our ability to identify trends over time has been compromised. So as a result, we've asked our site principals to share data from their site-based data collection that identifies areas of growth or needing to be addressed. They will share their reflections on the data that help inform their site action plans, which would be the next action item after this presentation. So at this time, I'd like to call on our first presenter. Oh wait, I think I have a slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> call on myself. <laughs> oh, and I already covered this. So, um, so as I mentioned, we did in the past. We would do study sessions around November, December, and review all the district data. Um, and obviously, the COVID pandemic has interrupted that progress. Uh, so we can't really identify trends over time. So what we felt would be best is that in this particular year, or possibly even next year, until we can develop trends over time with some. Um, assessment data, it, it would probably be best served to have the principals use data that is more local to their sites and that they can use not only to share their action plan but to kind of present the data uh, to the governing board as well. So with that, I will move on to our first presenter and that will be Miss Rebecca Rocha from <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. I know I was like, are we going high school and then going backwards? Okay. <laughs> um, so the data that we are looking at, like Mr. Heller said, it really is showing, uh, will be reflected in our LCAP in terms of what the needs are at our site. So these, this is some of the needs that we have. Um, going back along with the goals that Corinne presented um, for our LCAP, we have the same goals. So to increase academic, achieve, academic growth for all students while closing the existing achievement gap. So on that graph, um, as I explained to the teachers when I presented this to them, um, we're, we're showing the second grade map math scores from last spring. Um, I presented this to the whole staff and said, we're showing second grade, but that is reflective of TK, kinder, and first, because these are all of our students. Second grade is the last grade that we have with them, but it is no, it is by no means a reflection of just what happens in second grade. Um, so you can um, you can see that data. Um, you can see that there. One of the teachers asked, you know, is by with Hispanic Latino students, we have to keep in mind that it's not just English learners. We have, I believe, it's about thirty four percent of our school English learners, but many of our Latino students are um, predominantly English speaking. Ling English is their first language. So I just wanted to point that out in that, in that achievement gap. Um, so one of the things that we are doing, um, the, one of the activity strategies is that we have um, two teachers for, for math specifically. We have um, an academic intervention teacher on special assignment who's Kathy O'Connor that's working specifically with tier three students in math to improve their performance. Um, and we actually have another student, a teacher, um, Jocelyn Ivanhoff, who is primarily our reading intervention and ELD specialist. But given the model that we're using for that um, reading intervention, she does have a window of time that she's helping in second grade for this math intervention. So we actually have really small groups, anywhere between three to five students that are working four days a week for 25 minutes with these um, intervention teachers, while the classroom teacher then has the tier two students, um, and she's working with those students at that same time. Oh, I have the clicker. Um, so this is the uh, our second strategy. Our data that we are using is 41% um, of our English language learners are making progress towards English language proficiency as demonstrated on the LPAC test. Um, so our strategy for improving 
um, the increase of, of getting moving students towards redesignation, which we also understand probably won't happen by second grade because it takes many years to master a language. But we need to make sure that we're doing everything that we can, uh, TK through second, to make sure that we're giving those English language learners all of the strategies that we can to help them become proficient in English. Um, so our teachers just went through um, a certification process called GLAD, which stands for Guided Language Acquisition Design. So it turned out that seven of the uh, 13 teachers on the staff already had this certification. It's a very intensive, it's about a 15 hour training that teachers go through to learn strategies for teaching any curriculum, but it's sp their strategies that are specific for engaging um, English language learners so that you can teach students the content and the language at the same time. However, these strategies are also beneficial for any student because they're highly, it's a highly engaging way of teaching. So the, the, the six teachers that hadn't gone through the training just completed that training um, in October. And then just this week, we had the trainer on, and that was 12 hours of online training that they had to do, unfortunately, virtually, because that's the only way that it's being offered now. Um, but those six teachers completed that. And then this week, we had that trainer on our site for two days, and she was working with grade level teams to take that training to the next step and spent about two to three hours with each grade level team to plan on how they're going to implement those strategies in their next unit of study, um, particularly around our uh, language arts curriculum. And she also did some demonstration lessons in classrooms where every teacher was able to observe her. And then they would debrief afterwards what it is that she was doing and how they could implement those strategies in their classroom. And they, they just asked me today, if she could come back. So <laughs> they're super excited to be there. The teachers, what I want to say is they're very excited to be using these strategies with their teaching. It's really bringing their teaching to life and they're seeing how engaged the students are and how much language they're using in class. Um, for our, uh, our next uh, data slide that I'm showing is our map data. Again, second grade, but this is a culmination of students experience K2 or TK through second. Our MAP scores for reading from last spring. So again, you can see that achievement gap between our Latino students and our white students. Um, one of the focuses that we are also doing this year is that um, teachers are partici have participated and will continue to participate in professional development around guided reading. Um, we found that many of the teachers were very well versed in teaching phonics and isolated um, as an isolated skill and really needed more support with how to embed more um, comprehension and language and develop a love of reading with students. And so we started that training and um, our the teachers are also really excited to be kind of taking their small group um, Di reading differentiated reading to a true guided reading model and then our last slide oh no i think i have a few more um so this is an a uh, this is our our math school-wide map math data um, and that is the percentage of students it's not broken down by ethnicity percentage of students scoring below 40 percent um, so part of what i was explaining um in that model with when the um, math intervention teachers take the students that are struggling the most and then the classroom teacher is in her classroom with the next group of students working on supporting them with the math that the in the math work um, we have two paraeducators that push into uh, first and second grade classrooms during that time and they're helping the rest of the class with their independent math work so it's a very kind of complicated schedule that you would have to see on paper to understand how this is all happening at the same time. Um, and that means that students aren't being pulled out for any intervention. They're not missing anything because all the other students are working on something similar at the same time. And then this was our, um, the last piece of data is around our discipline referrals. So this is just showing from 1920, there were, I, th can't, I think it was 148 referrals 
Um, and that is for anything between something that might happen on the playground to something that might happen in the classroom that warrants kind of taking uh, t taking note of what may have happened with that student. Um, so this goes with our goal of enhance or establish culturally responsive healthy practices to support the whole school community. And our goal is to reduce discipline referrals by 30%. Um, so that second bar is just showing our goal that we would reduce those to 104. Thank you. Great. The first, <clears throat> this first two slides. So the first slide here shows reading measures of academic progress for our current third, fourth, and fifth graders. Um, now that was the fall. Our goal is around LCAP goal one, which is to increase the academic growth for all students while closing the academic, uh, the achievement gap. And our school site plan is looking to improve the function of our professional learning communities and develop and monitor first instruction that's intentional and then also support what their um, assessments are showing and then how the strategies are supporting the needs that we identify through our surveys and through our assessments. Um, what's very exciting um, now, MAP in the spring or in the fall, um, are, we'll look forward to state testing. Traditionally, we see a higher percentage that do actually meet the growth to have proficiency and advanced rates and we'll hope that that does continue to show. Um, what our teachers are able to do this year is to be able to look and see the relative strengths and weaknesses within each of the areas of our reading for informational vocabulary. Um, in the past, they've, they've noted that and have used strategies to make sure that they've recognized areas that they can continue to improve in. Um, and for each of their goals that are based on the reading standards, they're looking at past SMART goals that have recorded which strategies have worked the best for, their, for the um, past, adding those to what they're doing this year, and then continuing to notice after each cycle of instruction, uh, instruction how students have moved forward or not. Um, now, as far as the um, which students uh, Thank you. I'll, with the measures for the next slide, which shows the map growth, um, I think it makes a little bit more sense with, as far as our strategies, not only in the professional learning community of the classroom teaching, um, targeting students uh, through the map measures is a differentiation of each individual's test results. And they also use um, Edmentum, that is a program that shows what the students are going to, um, the responsive next um, learning that they need to be making. One of the things that in our learning communities in the past, we have done two cycles of learning based on each of our math and English reading strategies. Um, we've marked and seen how students already know a concept, which is called a pre-assessment. And so s teachers are continuing to have pre-assessments. Students actually see the results of that. And currently for this next, um, for our iterations this year, they see a pre-assessment and then are also um, having that stapled to their pre-assessment and then having it post-assessments also showing growth so that the students are able to see um, what areas that they've um, achieved in and what areas they need to do better on strategic math and reading standards. And this one is There we go. For LCAP 2, looking to see that policies and practices that promote social justice and equity, and how that also uh, 
ties in in this chart in particular to look and see the subpopulations and our um, achievement growth, the gaps that we have between some of our populations. Um, Apologize for my delay. Oh, let me collect my thoughts. So in for our um, uh, looking at our professional learning community, our multi-tiered, um, the main point for my chart is looking at our reading and the math growth and seeing how not only our white, Latino, but also our um, English language learners and our students with, dis with disabilities are making progress and what that looks like at this point when they've taken that last spring to what they're going to look, um, how the achievement will look at the end of the year. Um, now our groups monitoring our academic behavior and emotion um, are meeting regularly and so that is that they're monitoring, collecting, analyzing, and noting what the impact of the work is that they're doing. So our MTSS um, is meeting weekly and that also includes our social worker, Roxana Plancarte, in a similar fashion as primary school and our RLS as well has mentioned, um, our nurse, um, behaviorist, and our social, emotional, and um, reading and our intervention teacher and our res um, resource teacher as well. And um, my fourth slide will speak to our staff perception that are we meeting every student's needs. Um, each of these teams look at each of those three areas and continue to support um, just that targeted intervention, making sure that, that and also that the intervention is occurring um, during our school day within the teachers groups. So differentiating our, um, now that the um, ability to have students a little bit closer. We've been able to see teachers now working again with the small targeted groups that are flexible um, based on student need. Some students are also pulled out to work with our intervention teacher um, for math and for our reading. And um, those cycles are happening regularly where students are not put in those groups for the year like a remediation would be, but that it's every time that we take the reading inventory, measures of academic progress, each of our math tests, teachers are looking at the charts, making sure that the students that need the support are there and those that aren't are not over supported to give them a, you know, any sort of, um, we also have teachers that are working before school to not just have intervention, but also enrichment support that's um, stretching and doing some challenge in math. Reading has also started for some support as well. Um, that is for intervention for extra readers in the morning, and both of those are seeing a lot of students there. And then the next one. Um, so for our LCAP goal three with expanding our parent stakeholder and engagement within the school community, um, at our school site level, um, our opportunities for developing our partnerships and continuing to work with Boys and Girls Club, the Family Family Center, and that's to increase the access, the impact of the intervention and enrichment, and social uh, the social emotional um, development of students. Now in the California Healthy Kids survey, um, our, this is for our staff also take one every year. It's anonymous, but it has some key questions. Um, and in particular, this, uh, that first question really um, uh, looked, our staff had noticed that as an area that would be ripe to say, students that need the most academic support are receiving the support they need within the instructional model of the school. Um, there is definitely opportunity, <clears throat> some strongly agree, but the majority simply agree, and there's 10% uh, that don't agree that we're meeting every student need. Um, so for within our goals, um, the impact of our intervention is being shared every, in addition to our student team meetings, we've 
um, implemented our Up Valley Family Tutoring is happening again now with eight tutors that have begun to work with students. From last year, there was some Zoom tutoring that had begun, um, and the tutors that worked the best were with some of our writing support with very specific writing rubrics that they would ask questions that are similar to student uh, teacher questions like the Lucy Calkins writing project that we work on and then also uh, reading support as well. That the school motivates students to learn was also asked of teachers and it's also pretty equally split between strongly and agreeing. Um, so as far as having enrichment and the social emotional support ready for students so that they're ready and open and vibrant learners, um, we've been able to also add um, family center support um, through our, um, well, our behaviorist Dana Sabin has worked with um, conflict or friendship groups for a while, also with our um, speech and language pathologist, Melissa Wilson, um, and now, um, uh, our two Up Valley Family Center supporters who also work with the Clara and Clara program have begun to work with targeted third grade and some fourth grade groups. Um, and with that being able to help them there, they're talking to them about why it's important to be motivated in school, what working hard now will help them be able to achieve with their goals that go beyond school as well. And the intention is that those students will continue to work with them throughout this year, potentially into the future, and that can have those connections at RLS and high school as a mentor that guides them with behavior and also being supported for learning as well. <coughs> and then some questions, <coughs> excuse me, for students um, from Calfi the California Healthy Kids Survey. Um, that we want to have our goal also reflect the LCAP goal to enhance or establish culturally responsive healthy practices to support the whole school community. And specifically at our school, um, we're working to increase the quality, the frequency of social emotional learning, and also um, the physical education lessons and opportunities in all classrooms. Um, all classrooms have worked, to, we are mandated to have minutes, 100 extra minutes per week of of physical education and also to support social emotional learning. Um, uh, our teams are working knowing that, that, that the um, motivation, making sure that students are ready and active and able to have stamina to work and to continue to maintain focus. Um, our academic motivation, high expectations and being able to know that, that teachers are caring about them or that staff care about them are three of our leverage points that we're looking at here with the data. Um, uh, in 2017, the state um, standard is shown in orange. So the question specific to academic motivation is do you finish all your school assignments? Are you keeping to work and working on your schoolwork until you get it right? And do you keep on doing your schoolwork even when it's really hard for you? Um, with giving that tutor support and some of the support that are able to check in, the tutors specifically ask, okay, what's your next deadline? Let's make sure that you're done with that. And teachers are uh, actually noted that that helps leverage them that sometimes they won't do the work for their parent or some or themselves but they say okay he's coming he wants to see that and that special connection we're working to make sure that the right student has that right type of personality or connection with them to be um, to give them that extra high expectation <coughs> now also with caring relationships do teachers and grown-ups at school care about you do they listen to you when you have something to say do they make an effort to get to know you? Um, within our social emotional program, every teacher is committed to doing community circles with a certain types of feeling check-ins, giving reasons and, and quality um, opportunities to explore challenges. And then at the end, um, to choose an optimistic close to the week. Um, so for high expectations in the middle there, do teachers and grown-ups tell you when you do a good job? Do they believe you can do a good job and help you want to do your best? 
Um, within the social emotional program, an optimistic close at the end is a time when we purposely are asking them to think about a challenge and what they might have overcome. Say something you were really proud of this week or something that you thought was pretty difficult that you were able to overcome and maybe someone helped you with how to do that. So trying to help kids have that path that helps them be able to feel the connection, not just from teachers, but from community support members, tutors, Clara and Clara, or the Up Valley support, and then the, the staff as well, so that they're ready to learn, have high expectations, the stamina, and know that people care about their individual success and support. So the data that you show here, that you can see here, is the MAP scores from winter right immediately before the pandemic to last winter of 2020. And you can see the orange are the number of students, the percent of students who did not meet the growth expectations. And obviously the comparison from the prior year to the pandemic year pretty much doubled those numbers. So that data was obviously concerning, not surprising um, by any means, but concerning. And so one of the um, things that we are doing to address that are the professional learning community, um, California Principal Support Network training that I talked about earlier to really be able to focus in and use data to um, target exactly what students need and we are already seeing, um, we've given the map again since then, and we are already seeing this um, beginning to reverse itself. So we're extremely pleased about that. Um, this is also having to do with increasing academic growth for students. And this is data that is um, sadly a few years old because we don't have any recent data from CASP, but it is still a concern and I'm not sure that it has changed in particular. It's, it's um, evidenced in other areas as well. But I thought this is an easy way to see the difference between um, on the top, the math scores of our white students and of our Latino students. And on the bottom, the uh, comparison of the English language arts scores between our white students and our Latino students um, with the blue um, um, indicating the highest levels of achievement and the red indicating the lowest levels of achievement. And so that's why as a district and as a site, we have really thrown a lot of resources at this in order to try and reduce the, the achievement gap. Um, among those things are um, what I talked about earlier, um, our ELD support teacher, um, many other things that we're doing, training teachers, um, making sure that we are constantly aware of this and designing our practices to reduce this inequity. Um, LCAP goal number two is about, uh, again, social justice, equity, and access related to conditions of learning. It's actually really difficult to, to find very specific data to, to deal with that addresses that directly. But this is one piece of data from the California Healthy Kids Survey that um, I thought was quite interesting and we have really seen it, um, which is a question about sexual orientation of students. And this was given to seventh graders and um, there's 19% of students who uh, are not sure how they identify, but it is not as straight. Um, and, and we certainly see that at school and those students need help and they are confused in many cases and they have issues at home in some cases because of it. And so what can we do to help support those kids and make sure that they are feeling safe and comfortable at school? We have Unity Club for that. We have um, our counselor Terry is absolutely amazing. We have um, MTSS um, group that I spoke of earlier and uh, some of those kids who are really struggling are, are part of our focus group that we are really concerned about and keeping an eye on. We do, um, Roxana's involved. Um, we do home check-ins on students, not just students who are having um, questions about their sexuality, but in many other areas as well. Um, and there are, there are 
a number of things that are confusing to teenagers and um, there's racial issues happening. There's all of the larger society things that are happening that people bring into school. And so the class that I referenced earlier about bias in society is also something we added specifically to be aimed directly at how we can support everybody to feel like they're a part of our school and that they belong and that we care about every single one of them and that they're not just a student sitting in a chair to us, but that they're an individual person that is loved and that we want to support them. Did I go to? I did go to. Um, and along that same um, line is goal number two, which is the Responsibility Center Discipline Program. And I mentioned earlier that I had some data that I wanted to share. We started that program um, in 2018-19. I averaged it based on how long the school year was. So the, the blue is the number of students who had dis that number of discipline incidents. So um, in 2018-19, we had 50 unduplicated students, so an average of 10 different students each month. Um, and 108 separate incidents, so an average of 10.8. And those are incidents that were serious enough that they came to me. So they didn't just go to the campus supervisor. It's not something that the teacher just handled in class. It, it was escalated to the point where I was involved and it became um, a more serious discipline issue. Um, and that was the year when the teachers and we said we need to do something differently. And so we brought RCD in and then the very next year, and this was averaged by the seven month school year because it wasn't a full year, um, we had 27 unduplicated students, which was an average of 3.8 a month and 36 separate incidents, so um, 5.1 a month. So it, it um, dropped significantly, as you can see. The year before, um, there was one student who had 12 different big enough things to come to my office during the year. And that same student actually is shown the following year, he's the outlier in orange, he had five. We think, wow, five, that's a lot, but from 12 to five is, yeah. that's a huge, that is huge. And it's it's not just my time or effort or that, you know, he's in trouble or anything. It's It's what it does to kids inside. Nobody wants to be in trouble and nobody wants to feel like a failure and nobody wants to feel bad. And if we can do things proactively to build relationships and to keep kids from ending up in the office, that is our goal because it makes this culture of the school just so much better. Kids in middle school are dealing with enough internally and they don't try to be bad. They do the best they can every single day. Some days what they do is not as good as one would hope, but um, this program has been super supportive. And, and the, the 22, I actually think that's a huge big thing, 22 people had one incident, that means that when they really came to the office and had to really grapple with their own decisions through the RCD program, they didn't, that was it. They didn't have to come back later in the year. They were done, they figured it out. They developed their own strategies for how to control themselves. And they have that now, that ability to um, function in a classroom successfully. So we're really proud of that. Um, the next one is expanding student, parent, and stakeholder engagement within the school community. Um, so we want to, uh, we, I use this piece of data which has to do with tardies and, and that's a piece of engagement. And um, we have a, a large gap between our Hispanic community and our white community in terms of the number of kids who are tardy. And it's a lot of kids any way you look at it. <laughs> And um, so this year we are trying something different. We have um, done a lot of research about it. And it turns out that tardies are similar to um, behavior in general, which is you can't really fix um, behavior by punishing it out of people for the most part. Um, really what changes behavior is um, education and making people reflect on it themselves and come to their own conclusions. So what we're doing for tardies now, and it's a new program, we will see how it goes, I'll have data later. But what we're doing with it is when students are consistently tardy, they have a tardy intervention um, program that we go through. So they fill out a, a worksheet where they have to think about, okay, what is the, what is going on at home basically? What could you do differently? What's your solution? And their parents do it with them. So it's a family, because it's not the kid's fault much of the time. I mean, it's a whole 
series of people not figuring out what needs to happen. And so it really is this decision about how can we work together to solve this problem and really having a conversation with both the kids and the families about the impact it has on them, on the rest of the class, on the instruction that's happening when they interrupt it and the fact that they missed the beginning part of it. And it has been so far, it's looking really positive and we have high hopes that it will make a difference for students. And um, you know, it's really hard to start the day behind. It doesn't feel good. And it doesn't set the tone for the rest of the day that we would want to set. Plus they miss wellness in the morning, so you know. Um, and that is it for me. I'll pass it on to Greg. Good evening, everybody. I'm filling in for uh, Mr. Sinto today, who would like to be here. Um, so I am happily taking his place. So um, the SPSA for the high school uh, is uh, parallels the specific goals in the district LCAP and centers on the critical areas for focus identified in uh, the WAS visiting committee and the WAS report. Um, slide one. Uh, umbrella under SHUSD's LCAP goal one, our first SBSA goal is to continue to infuse critical thinking, creativity, communication, collaboration, and citizenship into all learning environments. This goal reflects our current student learner outcomes and the WASP critical area of focus of increasing student engagement and incentivizing the learning process by employing more critical thinking and problem solving opportunities. As you can see on this slide, one of the metrics we use to measure this goal is the Early Assessment Program, or EAP. The EAP is tied to the 11th grade CASP, English and Math State Assessments, and is designed to provide students with an early signal of college academic preparation or readiness. It is important to note that the EAP scores are just one multiple measure. The CSU utilizes an indicator of student readiness for college level coursework in English and mathematics and for placement of first time freshmen. Due to COVID-19 disruptions that Mr. Heller mentioned today, CSU campuses will use high school GPA, high school math GPA, and high and college coursework in absence of standardized test results such as the CASP, SAT, to elevate a student's placement in general education, English, math, and quantitative reasoning courses. Here is where maintaining our expository reading and writing curriculum, or ERWC, and implementing Napa Valley College English 90 course in our master schedule has helped support our students' matriculation to the next level. Some of the strategies we will utilize to achieve this goal would include participating in Stanford University D school training for our teachers, exploring critical thinking assessments such as the college and career readiness assessment, and utilizing the depth and knowledge DOK or DOK flowchart that assists teachers in developing their lessons at DOK, DOK level two or higher. All right. Our second SBSA goal, which aligns with uh, LCAP goal two, is the development and implement of the new adult transition program for 18 to 22 year old students with disabilities. Thankfully, the board has already been shown the fruits of the newly developed program in Ms. O'Donnell's most recent presentation to the board. As you can see, the data on this slide illustrates our special education student cohort, which represents resource students and SDC students. Graduation rates are significantly lower when compared to Napa County and statewide totals. One of the things that Mr. Sinto is always trying to do is look at how we read that data. And it is easy to see that our small cohort, when compared to larger cohorts in the county, skews data in that our percentages will always be higher. Right. It is inappropriate to force regular high school diploma for students with severe disabilities, not to mention that their high school and transition program trajectory is set in motion long before they ever come to the high school. The transition program will focus on personal and social skill development, vocational preparation and employment planning and independent living skills. I know this program is very important to Mr. Sento and so far it's been very successful um, at the, it's housed at the elementary school. 
So those students are getting the best shot possible. All right, slide number three focus on, on continuing to solicit student voice in our FBSA goal three. Um, in addition to the call of action from June of 2019, with it, which initiated greater solicitation of student voice, the most recent school climate index, a metric of the California Healthy Kids survey that you see up there on the slide, warrants more frequent pulse taking of our students, particularly in the areas of academic motivation and meaningful participation. All the listed strategies in our single plan under this goal elevate the student voice in different domains, among students, among staff, and within larger community. Examples of this would include quarterly student Congress meetings, meeting with demographically representative classes to discuss race and social justi justice, some of which Mr. Heller attends as well, and partnering with the City of St. Helena staff on their youth initiative. While efforts in this area might seem secondary, student connectedness is the bread and butter of St. Helena High School, and growth in this area facilitates progress in all areas, including academics, school environment, culture. S our SBSA goal four it focuses on continuing to build our multi-tiered system of support MTSS at the secondary levels, including universal design of for learning UDL, which is called UDL professional development. This aligns with SH, S SHUSD's LCAP goal four of enhancing and establishing culturally responsive healthy practices to support whole school community. While an inconsistent, me, inconsistent metric made up of multiple changing measures, many of which are contingent on students' choice via course-taking behavior, it is our goal to improve in this area. The data you, you see presented in the slide was taken from the California dashboard and indicates college and career preparation. As you can see, there were declines in our Hispanic and socioeconomically disadvantaged subgroups. Once again, due to our fluctuating and small cohort size, our percentage swings will always be more pronounced when compared to a larger cohort. With the addition of Roxana Plancarte, that did an excellent um, presentation to the board this evening, and the conscientious work of our school counselors and administration has all aided in growing dialogue around student support and outcomes for all subgroups. We still have a great deal of work to be done in terms of systemization of our MTSS tiers that include academics, behavior attendance, social, emotional, and college and career readiness. Bi-weekly meetings have been established to see the effectiveness of our MTSS strategies and to identify gaps, opportunities for growth, and allocations of resources. And finally, Our goal number five. Uh, this is to prepare to implement the IC3 certification course in ninth grade humanities essentials for the 2022-2023 school year. This focuses on informational literacy. Where appropriate to the content, infuse financial literacy questions into math instruction, for example, economic choice, role of the economy, financial management, budgeting, investing, and implement a financial boot camp as part of the Know Before You Go program, which we've totally revamped and reorganized this year. While not tied to a specific LCAP goal, through self identification during the WASP self study and as recommended by the visiting committee, we have set out on a course to augment our ninth grade essentials in humanities course to infuse a more robust and direct instruction in information literacy with the potential for industry based certification. As you can see in the college and career data on the slide, 2019 showed a dip in students classified as prepared and a large increase in students classified as unprepared. This goal directly supports the ambitions of California Technology Scope and Sequence, which is headed by Ms. Stubbs and is the focus of our technology committee. It is important to note that the work in this area was wholly selected and supported by our parent group during the WASP process. 
I believe that's it. Thank you. Questions, questions and comments? Is there any public comment on this presentation? Uh, trustees, comments and questions? A lot of material. And this would pertain to all four um, yeah. schools. Sure. You know, I just um, I want to thank I think um, very much um, all of the the reports on this and and just and being very honest and frank as far as kind of where we're at and what is needed and and where we need to go from here. Um, so and so my my thought is is just as. As you know, our, our, our board is our priority, is our, is our student success, and however it may look. Um, and I just want you to know, and this is, and I'm, I, I can imagine this coming, it could come from all of us. If there's anything that you need from us, please let us know. Please, because we're here, we're, we want to support you in any way we can, and we want to support the students. Um, and, you know, just thank you for all the work that you're doing and all of the, the information that you provided us tonight about the students. Um, I was just going to say that I'm sure it was a, um, it's been a challenge to put this data together. So I too appreciate um, all the effort and the work, the time that went into this. But, and, and just like Trustee Kerr said, I appreciate having the honest, um, outlook. I appreciate taking, you know, even thinking outside the box, like the career and college um, data. That's important for us to know as well. Um, so I just, um, I just am just grateful that we have a kind of a true sh snapshot of what's going on. Um, I don't really have any questions per se. I just, as I was reading through this presentation, I just kept thinking like, this was really um, a great effort in showing us the data that is available and how it's affecting our students. So um, I, I thank you for that. Julia? Yeah, I agree with uh, Trustee Pelosi in terms of the, da the data that's available and, and how that's a challenge to, to represent everything. But I think it, um, each principal did a, a, a great job of kind of highlighting what each school um, the areas that they're focusing on and I think um, and in terms of the, the strategies that they're going to be using so it, it, it is a lot of information so it's kind of hard to gauge where to start out so I guess I know all the the goals or strategies are important but I guess if I had a question is there um, for the principals is there one that takes like a higher priority like I know they're all important but is there one that you guys or particularly looking at in terms of, you know, that that you want to really focus on. I know you're going to focus on all f on all five or four, but just in general, is there one that you would look at to say like this is the one that we are kind of focusing on the most? That's a hard question, but Trustee Olguin, are you asking each principal to ask, answer that yeah, question? Answer for Mr. Sindo, yeah, but just in I'm, general, since I'm standing here, I'll is there a prior, I, I guess is there a um, school priority at each dis, or at each school? Yeah, set, I like think the priority up? for us is um, definitely because of the pandemic and students coming back to a full mm -hmm. schedule. I think really hearing student voice and our goal focused on student voice and making sure that they're representative uh, on all the things that we do. I think that's incredibly important to the school, to the teachers, that you know, we wanna make sure that our students have the best educational opportunities possible. So we wanna hear how they're, they're our customers, so to speak, so we wanna hear from them about how the education is going. Thank you. Would you like each principal to answer this question? Yeah. Principals, please come to the microphone. Thank you. I would say in a quick reflection of your question, for, for, for me, it would be just that data on that English learner proficiency because everything else that we're doing is, is going to contribute to those English learners. And that goes back to that discrepancy in that data that you saw too. So if we, any all of the initiatives that we have, I think will will 
work for all students, but specifically because we want to address that achievement gap, those English learners, and that will be demonstrated in their math scores, in their reading scores. So I would say that. Yeah, they're definitely all important. I know that increasing the academic success and growth for all students while closing the, the achievement gap, that is something that's so measurable and that at least in the areas that we're targeting with reading and math and some of our writing as well, and that in order to do that, the other goals all tie in and help, help um, create the conditions that will allow us to do that as well. Um, and for us, it's recognizing that um, in order to uh, raise academic achievement for every kid, um, you have to be aware of everything that ties in with that. So social emotional needs, the wellness needs, all of the outside factors that affect outside and internal factors that affect how kids do in school. So it's, I don't think I can single out one thing. It's, it's um, a multi-tiered level of supporting students. Thank you for that. Thank you. Can I ask Principal Cox a quick question? Sure. I wanted to say that I was really impressed with the data behind the Responsibility Center discipline and how much it dropped in just one school year. And my question is, does the high school use this approach as well, or is this just? At, the, at this point, it's just RLS. Um, it, we found this program um, at a time when some teachers were uh, really we had a a group of kids that were challenging to the teachers. You know, sometimes it's not a great match, and it was a year when people were struggling, and um, teachers were feeling like what they were doing wasn't working, and they were open to trying something completely, utterly different than they had ever done before, and because it came from teachers, I think that's a lot of what's made it successful, um, is that it's it wasn't top-down, it really was, we brought this guy, they talked to everyone, and the teachers are like, yeah, we, we want to try it. We're going to do this. So, yeah. Yeah, it makes me, thank you. It makes me think about how do we continue to support children who've benefited from RCD when they leave the middle school and head into high school. I'm a big for, fan. Cover a conversation later, perhaps. It's work. Yeah. It, it, it really is work for everybody involved, but it's teaching students skills that will benefit them throughout their life. I mean, I think sort of the tagline of the program, if you can call it that, I mean, it's not a like design program in that way, but is if there's one thing that we can do to help kids more than anything else we will ever teach them, it is teaching them self-control. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, when you think about it, the reason every person in this room is sitting here is because we figured out what we need to do to get through the day. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I, I just um, have one myself. I, I, I actually, I wasn't expecting to see, um, I knew that there was going to be uh, the achievement gap and the, um, the uh, not meeting standards um, as a result of the pandemic. In some cases, it was a little bit larger um, uh, portion of students not achieving the standards than I actually originally was going to expect. expect. And um, I know that it's been really a challenging situation for everyone. And I, I, I also think that um, it, it is difficult for our staff to see and to know that, that it is um, a difficult hill to climb ahead. And I just want to make sure that um, our staff knows that um, the board is here to support them in achieving their goals for our students as well. So um, I think that we all we all are talking about student wellness, but we know that um, we have to have staff wellness and support our staff so that so that they can come to school with the positive mindset that they can um, bring their students up to the standards that um, will help them succeed in later life. Um, it's it's uh, it's going to be difficult to come back from from what we've all been through, but I know that we have the resources to do it and um, the good intentions and um, the the expertise, most of all the expertise of our staff. So um, on to and I'm. 
trying to get out of my PowerPoint so I can see what where we are. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, on to uh, 10D. So this is consideration of approval for the SHUSD 2021-2022 Site Strategic Action Plans. Like to call him Mr. Christopher Heller. Yes, so the data has been presented, and these are the associated plans that show the actions related to addressing the data. And I would ask that the board um, approve these. Um, so, is there, an, is there any public comment on this agenda item? Uh, trustees' comments or questions? No. No. Is there a motion to approve the 2021-2022 site action plans as presented? I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. And next we have um, item 11A. That would be the request to accept gifts, donations, or earmarked funds. Um, Trustee Elgin, are you um, ready to read the... Uh, donations to our school district or, or was it was it no no I think I'm sorry I'm supposed to you, oh sorry I'm no my apologies I was looking at the wrong thing I thought you went out of order my apologies okay. <laughs> so uh, trustee Elgin um, do you want to yep. go ahead and read this the board is asked to accept uh, with gratitude the following donations St. Lena High School received a donation of $100,000 from an anonymous donor for the St. Lena High School Athletic Hall of Fame project. St. Lena High School has also received following donations totaling $149,922. Uh, first amount, $189 from Sport and Cycle, donated to football, uh, donation in uh, fanware sales. Donation of $3,000 from Carlo Trinquero for football. Uh, football equipment and supplies donation. $19 sport and cycle for football donation, fanware sales. Uh, $3,000 St. Athletic Association, St. Lena High School Fall Sports, 21 22 team donation for fall sports. $3,000 First Presbyterian Church, St. Lena High School Scholarships, 2021 Violet Young Memorial Scholarship. $1,000 First Presbyterian Church, St. Lena High School Scholarships, 2021 Peacemaking Scholarship. $500 Napa Bar Association, St. Lena High School Scholarship, 2021 Scholarship. Uh, $73,500 from Anonymous for uh, St. Lena High School Scholarship, and that's also 2021 Scholarships. $1,000 uh, Gerald Hyde for St. Lena High School Scholarship for 2021 uh, J&M Hyde Community College in memory of Bruce Frank Scholarship. $750 from Community Foundation of the Napa Valley for St. Lena High School Scholarship, and that's for the 2021 class of 1952 scholarships. $1,000 from Community Foundation of the Napa Valley for St. Lena High School Scholarships, 2021 class of 1968 scholarships. $2,000 from Community Foundation of the Napa Valley for the St. Lena High School Scholarships, and that's for 2021 Bruce Frank Scholarships. Uh, $40,000 from the Community Foundation of the Napa Valley, a St. Lena High School Scholarship for the 2021 Wood Family Scholarships. Uh, $4,000 from Napa County Landmarks Incorporated for the St. Lena High School Scholarships, and that's for 2021 scholarships as well. And finally, $16,964 uh, for Saints Athletic Association, uh, various fall sports equipment, HUDL package. Again, the board and district are grateful for all the donations to, um, to our program, our school. Yes, and I, I do um, thank you for reading all of the, uh, the scholarships, Julio. I think that um, I'd just like to add the total was um, 249,992 scholarship dollars in scholarships and donations to our programs. Um, is there any public comment on this agenda item? Board members, comments and questions? No. I just um, I would like to thank our community for their generosity in supporting our, our students and our schools. 
uh, it's really um, important that um, every one of these donors be recognized. Thank you. This uh, is an action item. Then we do have an action. I am sorry. Is there, is there a motion to approve the acceptance of gifts, donations, and earmark funds as presented? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. 11B, written report on the District of Choice program. I'd like to remind the board that this is a rip written report. Is there a public comment on this agenda item? Uh, uh, board members, comments or questions? No questions. No, no. Not at this no. time. Thank you. Thank you. On to item 12A, uh, review and request for approval of the 2021-2022 certificated seniority list. I'd like to call on Mr. Christopher Heller. This action item establishes an annual ranking order for certificated employees um, for seniority as a district employee based on their date of hire. In the event we were presented with the task of a layoff, um, this list determines which employees of least seniority would be considered for layoffs first. This list has been reviewed by SHTA leadership and its membership and is presented as a final document and the board is asked to approve this list. Is there any public comment on this agenda item? Do I have a, a motion to approve the 2021-2022 certificated seniority list as presented? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. Review and request for approval of the 2021-2022 seniority list for CSEA employees, classified management, and confidential personnel. I'd like to call on Mr. Christopher Heller. Yes, under the exact same premise as the previous item, this list establishes our rank order for classified, um, classified uh, employees management and I lost it, hang on one sec. Confidential. Confidential, thank you. Um, it's been presented to CSEA Chapter 287 for their approval and review, and the board is asked to approve this list as well. Uh, is there anyone present who wishes to publicly comment on this agenda item? Trustees, comments or questions? Is there a motion to approve the 2021-2022 CSEA Classified Management and Confidential Seniority List as presented? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. Uh, consideration of approval of the Sunshine Proposal from the SHTA to the SHUSD. Um, I'd like to call on Mr. Brandon Farrell. Right, good evening. This proposal um, uh, officially opens um, our negotiation cycle that is uh, set to begin before March of 2022, I believe. And uh, this uh, request is just, I think it's asked for approval, right? There you go. Is there anyone who wishes to publicly comment on this agenda item? Do the trustees have any comments or questions? Is there a motion to approve the Sunshine Proposal from SHTA to SHUSD as presented? I'll make a go ahead. motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 A motion carried. Okay. Uh, on to facilities, item 13. Um, this is a written report uh, from um, on the facilities update for November 2021. And uh, is there any public comment on this agenda item? Trustees, comments or questions? No, no questions. And uh, I did have a question that was answered in the um, uh, subs uh, supplemental oh, uh, um, 
item, so it, everyone can check that out if they wish. Um, on to uh, item 14, business operations. Uh, item 14A, review of the 2021-2022 Educator Effectiveness Block Grant Expenditure Plan. I would like to call on Ms. Sandy Steps. Good evening, thank you. The district received a one-time educator effectiveness grant in 2015-16, but it was for a much smaller amount, approximately $50,000, uh, if I recall. And then this is another allocation of the same type of funding. Uh, however, this time our allocation is $390,439. And the funds can be used for professional development, coaching, and mentoring, and other activities designed to enhance educator effectiveness. And all of the allowable uses are shown within the expenditure plan, which also includes a timeline for spending. And we have until 2026 to spend the funds, so I've established a plan to spread the money out over the next five years, which is shown towards the end of the document there. Uh, these dollars will help us to free up some general fund monies that we would ordinarily use towards activities such as working with West Ed and attending conferences and trainings. There are no specific template requirements for the plan and the level of detail shown is adequate for compliance. This will allow some flexibility in terms of how we budget the dollars in each year. So if we decide to spend more, say, uh, under the category of travel and conferences in a particular year, we can shift it from something else. And um, so for this item, a uh, public hearing is required with board approval at a subsequent meeting. Uh, uh, pardon me, it's in the public hearing right afterwards. Or no, no. Pardon me, I'm incorrect there. This item is presented for information and public comment tonight, public so there's comment. not a public hearing required, okay. just uh, the opportunity for public comment. Okay, so um, is there any public comment on this agenda item? Uh, trustees, comments or questions? No, actually, your, your, your supplemental question was one that I had as well, so it was answered. I did as well, thank you, same question. So and, and just a, rem, um, a reminder to everyone here, the supplemental question was that we can, sh and it was addressed by um, Ms. Stubbs, um, we can uh, change the um, allocation of funds um, if there is need uh, in the district and the budget can be adjusted. So um, uh, we are now on to item 14B, which is the public hearing and consideration of approval regarding a staff request to submit an application to waive education code section 45134C. I'd like to call on Ms. Andy Stuggs. Thank you. The district currently pays stipends for walk-on athletic coaches who do not hold a credential and active certificated employees who want to coach. However, if a retired certificated employee who receives a pension from STRS wants to coach, they currently can't do so under Education Code 45134, which states that a STRS retiree cannot work in a classified position except in some cases as a paraeducator. And our coaching stipends are technically considered classified because a teaching credential is not required to perform the work. We'd like to broaden the hiring pool to allow retired certificated employees to apply for our coaching positions. Uh, and legal counsel has recommended that the way to do that is by applying for a waiver for that particular section of the Ed Code through the California Department of Education. The waiver process requires that we consult with our bargaining units and obtain board approval after a public hearing. Mr. Heller and I have consulted with both SHTA and CSEA, and both bargaining units support the district's waiver application. After a public hearing this evening, uh, the board is asked to consider approving our request to submit a waiver application to the Department of Education. The process for approval would then take approximately 10 to 12 weeks to complete at the state level, and if approved, the waiver would be in place for two years, and we could apply to renew it after that. So with that, I would ask the board to conduct a public hearing, definitely in this case, and consider approval of the request to submit a waiver.
So um, uh, this time uh, there is going to be a public hearing for the application to waive California Education Code 45134C. Now open at 8.30 p.m. <laughs> if, if the phone didn't wake you up, that did. <laughs> So we will um, we will have this uh, we will be open for public comment in the public hearing for 60 seconds at least. Hello, I'd like to uh, make the board aware as the athletic director um, that after um, being. Uh, attending a conference that Mr. Heller recommended uh, over law and liability and CIF sports. Um, I learned that 30 years ago, the number of coaches that were teachers was in the 80 percentile. And now, uh, to this day, it's flipped completely opposite to the 15 to 20 percentile. So um, applying for this waiver really gives us an opportunity to use as many coaches as we possibly can that have educational experience. So it's it's really important for us to find good qualified coaches and I think that that's important for the board to know. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? The public hearing is now closed at 8.32 p.m. Do the trustees have any questions about the application to waive California Education Code 45134C? I have a quick question. So the application is for two years, is that correct? Yes, and then we can apply to renew it if, if oh. the board so chooses. Does it know if it, oh, so, oh, and I'm just giving an example. So we're, so will we have to do an application for each candidate or each coach that may be coming in or does this does this this the application for two years for th three or four or however many we need I mean do we have to do an application each time I guess is my question Correct. that's a good question we just have to do one application because we're applying to waive the ed code uh, okay. for any potential applicants okay good to know. thank you that are certificated retirees okay for a for a community our size and um, I, th I believe that this is definitely in the best interest of our students so is there a motion to approve the application to waive California education code five four five one three four C as presented I'll make that motion is there a second I'll second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. Motion carried. Review and consideration of approval of contracts over $25,000, November 2021. I'd like to call on Miss Andy Stubbs. Thank you. We have three contracts over $25,000 for the board to consider approving this evening. The first two are associated with the St. Helena High School Athletic Hall of Fame project for architectural and project management services. Uh, and actually the donation that the board approved earlier this evening will cover these costs. And the final contract is with Paper, the company that provides online tutoring for students. And we heard a little bit about that earlier this evening as well. This is the second year of utilizing these services and we are using COVID-19 relief funds to cover the costs for these services. And this will provide licenses for all of our secondary students. So, uh um, I'm sorry, is there any public comment on this agenda item? Comments and questions? I had a couple of questions, just clarifying. Um, on that GWC contract, are those percentages set by the um, OPSC? Uh, on, when you look on the d document, there's a, like a, a proposal. So hang on one second and I'll pick it up. Um, is this on uh, a, attachment C2 when it says like the apportionment there's a percentage in the far left columns. I just was curious if those are set by the, um, what is it, Office of, no, what is it called, OPS, I know I, I memorized it last night. OPSC, but. the Office of Public School Construction. Thank you very much. 
Are, is it set by them, those percentages, or is that a, um, or is that the construction management fee that you know that's kind of dictates those percentages? Uh, that's there. That's um, it is. It's it's so the OPSC they are using the fee scale as okay. you can see from the the top there. Right. So I just wanted, to, but so those those percentages are set by that organization. Yes. Okay. Correct. I just was trying to get a clarifying. Um, and then my other question was on the paper tutoring. Okay, so 857 licenses, and that's just for anybody who doesn't know. That's for, it's six through 12, correct? Correct. Okay, and do we have any idea? Trustee um, Pelosi, oh, it's fourth grade through 12th grade. Fourth through 12th, okay. Apologies, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any idea of how many students are actually using that? Just, it's not okay if we don't have that number right now. I just thought if somebody kind of had a ballpark. Miss Allen, could you come to the microphone, please? Yes, we started PRing it at the very beginning of the school year at back to school events. And approximately right now we have 106 students who have used it. Okay. Um, so we are continuing to PR it. We just had a couple of events at RLS and we will continue to put it out there okay. to the families and to the students. Okay, and you kind of answered my other second question because I was looking for an example of the marketing strategy or the materials used to, the, to grow the engagement. So it's talked about obviously at back to school nights or emails mm -hmm. that are pushed out to parents, I'm assuming, and to students. It's been pushed out to the parents, definitely. We've put a lot of stuff out as well as to the students. Corinne, you just had a, a training. Do you mind just coming on up and just sharing a little bit about how paper presented to your faculty last week? This will give you an idea. Okay, thank you. Um, sure, they did a Zoom meeting at a faculty meeting to go over how to use paper in a variety of ways other than just telling kids to log on, how you yeah. could use it uh, within the classroom as essentially um, almost like paraprofessional support. So um, in, within small groups, they could log on and have their own tutor working with their small group. Um, they provided um, um, strategies and ideas to for teachers to have for example when students email them I'm currently unavailable outside of hours you can contact paper ideas like that to help um, PR to kids and make sure they understand how to use it and that teachers understand how to use it other than just saying there it is go use it okay great thank did you did that answer your question yes it did okay. it helps thank you uh, any other comments or questions? Yeah. I have a question about oh. um, paper. Is it offered in Spanish? Okay. <laughs> that was it. That's, it's, it. Can we have a verbal answer? It's yes, I was just, I just was <laughs> <laughs> catching not, myself on that one. It's not only answered in, it's not only available in Spanish, it's available in many languages. Multiple languages. Multiple languages. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Okay. Um, so I am uh, um, wondering if anyone uh, has a motion to approve the contracts over $25,000 as presented. I'll make a motion to approve the contracts over 25000 as presented. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. On to item 15A, future agenda items. Uh, we have everything um, listed for our December 16th, 2021 regular board meeting. For anyone watching, our next board meeting will be December 16th, same time, uh, same YouTube channel. Uh, do any trustees have any subjects for future agenda items that they wish to bring up? Not at this time, thank okay. you. Uh, and. Um, I'm to item 16A. Do I have a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you and good night.